In this talk, I'm going to talk about long-time solution of the Kähler Vichy flow. So let me first begin with some introduction of the Vichy flow. Uh, so I let m and g0 be a Riemannian manifold, and then which flow equation is given as follows. Um, so dg dt equals the negative direction of um, the Vichy tensor, uh, sine with a matrix g0. And is uh, which for, uh, the which flow equation is a nonlinear weakly parabolic system of PDEs and is introduced by Richard Hamilton in 1982. Uh, and in the 1982 papers, he used the Ricci flow to show whatever uh, free manifold uh, if it has a, a positive uh, Ricci curvature on a compact free uh, dimensional manifold, then the Ricci flow will converge this manifold. Uh, into one that has constant sectional curvature, and hence it's a special, uh, is a spherical space form. Okay. Uh, so starting uh, from eighty two, okay, uh, there's a uh, after the Hamilton's results come up, uh, it immediately becomes a major tool in geometric analysis, and it was used to solve many uh, important conjectures. For example, the Poincaré conjectures uh, by Hamilton and Perlman. And also uh, recently by uh, Brando and Shane uh, on the differentiable sphere theorems about quarter pinch uh, metrics. So in this talk, I um, will mainly focus on the Kähler case, okay? and this is called the Kähler Ricci flow. And my talk will be mainly on compact Kähler manifolds. And so let's also review a little bit about what it uh, mean by Kähler manifold. So first. The okay, k-manifold is a complex manifold, uh, so x is uh, the, la uh, the label of the complex manifold, and then j is the complex structure. Um, and we will say, first of all, j is a uh, g is a, uh, a Hermitian metric with respect to this complex structure, if this is a, a j invariant metric. Okay? So meaning that if you uh, having the j act on both of the, the vectors, then the, the inner product between these two vectors will be preserved. And um, using this metric, we are able to uh, define a two-form omega that uh, you put the j uh, to, or you let the j act on the first vector, okay, uh, but not on the second vector. And then by the conditions that j square equals identity, and also that uh, the metric G is J invariant, then one can easily show that this uh, expression here is actually a two form. Okay? And then locally, it actually looks pretty much like the metric, okay? except that uh, for metric, we put a tensor symbol here. But now in a two form, uh, coordinate wise or component wise, it still equals to, or somewhat equal to GIJ. Okay? Uh, but except that uh, we are replacing the metric by a wedge. Okay? So it has a local expression like this. Okay? So uh, a metric is called a Kähler metric uh, if and only if um, the omega, which is a true form right now, okay, is d closed. Okay? So d here is the exterior derivative. So if you use the exterior derivative differentiating the omega, uh, it gets zeros. Then we call the metric to be a Kähler metric okay? uh, or Kähler metric with respect to the chosen complex structure. So one special thing that makes a uh, Kähler case of the Ricci flow special is uh, there's a special form about the Ricci tensor uh, in the Kähler case. Okay? So that allows us to turn the Ricci flow equations into a complex Montrampe equations. And the formula is as follows. So, so um, the Rij bar, okay, meaning that you put in the, um, so in my notation here, Gij bar, it means that you are putting in this uh, ddzi and ddzj vectors, okay? And then similarly for the Rij, okay? Um, so the Rij bar, um, it has a very special form. It's basically the compact hexins of the negative of log of the determinant of the metric, okay? Um, and this is this formula that makes the Kähler-Vichy flow special or, or distinct, uh, distinctive. From the Riemannian counterparts, okay? and the Ricci uh, here sometimes uh, uh, we may denote Ricci as a Ricci tensor, but maybe sometimes just like uh, the metric, we will denote it as a form. Okay, uh, we are going to define this 
uh, as the Ritchie form. Okay. Uh, sometimes we'll talk about Ritchie tensor, but some sometimes it's more convenient for us to talk about forms. Okay, so um, what is the Kähler Ritchie flow? So Kähler Ritchie flow is nothing but just the Ritchie flow on Kähler manifold. Uh, and it's known that uh, if you start the Ritchie flow from a Kähler metric, it's going to be preserved along the flow. Uh, so therefore, in short, we just call it a Kähler Ritchie flow. Okay. So uh, now I'm given a uh, Kähler manifold, compact Kähler manifold X with complex structure J and initial metric uh, omega zero, okay, or omega naught. Okay. So sometimes I would just uh, abuse the lamb uh, metric and forms uh, interchangeably. Okay? So sometimes, I'm, I'm, uh, although this is, should be called a Kähler form, but sometimes I will just abuse my language a little bit and call it a uh, Kähler metric. Okay? Um, so what is the Kähler Ritchie flow? It's just nothing but just uh, uh, the Ritchie flow on Kähler manifold, and sometimes it may be more convenient to denote the flow using forms rather than just metric, but they are equivalent because by the previous slides, you can see here uh, the omega, which is the Kähler form. Okay? Uh, it has this as the component, and the Ritchie form has this as the component. So, uh, looking this equation as uh, equation on forms is actually just equivalent to looking at this equation uh, in terms of metric tensor and Ritchie tensor. And somehow uh, we will normalize the Kähler Ritchie flow uh, according to our uh, needs. Because uh, sometimes we want to keep the volume fixed, okay? So depending on the situations, okay, we may put a plus or minus here to make sure we have a bounded volume. Okay. Um, so the Kähler Ritchie flow was introduced in 1985, which is three years later uh, than uh, the remaining Ritchie flow was introduced. Uh, it was introduced by Kwai Long Chao. Uh, in in his work, okay. Uh, he proved basically uh, he he show discuss what happened in the in the case when the first trend class is negative or when the first trend class is zero and then he was actually able to reprove the Calabi conjecture which was previously proven by Yao uh, using elliptic methods. So along the Ritchie flow there are several things. Uh, uh, first, the J is fixed along the flow. That means we don't change the complex structure. We only change the metric. And more importantly, is the Kähler condition is preserved along the flow. So um, that makes uh, the Kähler Ritchie flow special. Okay. And um, another thing that is uh, quite uh, special about Kähler Ritchie flow from the just remaining case okay, is that it has a very close uh, relation with all these cohomology classes. Okay. So first of all, we have uh, something called a Kähler class, okay? where uh, the Ritchie flow preserves the Kähler condition, so we are able to define a evolving Kähler form, okay, omega t, using the evolving metric gt. Uh, it's going to be close to form because the Kähler condition is preserved, and therefore for each time uh, this uh, two form here, it represents a cohomology class, okay, the RAM cohomology class of the manifold in, inside H2. And um, because by the Ritchie flow equation, okay, which was uh, written as uh, d omega dt equals the negative of Ritchie, and then if we pass everything to the cohomology, then uh, the right hand side here will becomes uh, uh, the derivative of uh, the Kähler form, okay. So the left hand side will become the derivative of the Kähler form. Okay? But more interestingly is the, the left hand side here, the, so the right hand side, side here, which was uh, represented by the negative of the Ricci. And that is the first trend class. Okay? And then it's well known that the first trend class is uh, unchanged uh, along the flow because the complex structure doesn't change. Okay? It was a very well long result that the first trend class depends only on the complex structure but not on the metrics even though it's defined using the Ritchie tensor. Um, but uh, Ritchie tensor changes when the metric changes, but on the cohomology level, it's, it's fixed. Okay? So um, this is fixed along the flow. So therefore, we are able uh, to easily solve uh, the uh, ODE system and then uh, 
get the, the evolving uh, Kla class uh, is basically is a linear combination of uh, the initial Kla class and also the first chain class. Uh, so in other words, we can actually predict what happened to the Kla class. Okay? And then why is it so uh, important about this observation is um, the Kla class actually determines a lot of things okay, of the manifold. For example, the volume. The total volume is determined by the Kla class. Uh, if you have any submanifolds, complex submanifold of x, then the area or the uh, lower dimensional volume of that uh, complex submanifold is also determined by the Kla class. It is given by the Stokes theorem. Applying the Stokes theorem using the declosed condition of the omega t, then one can get this uh, result that that the if you choose any other metrics in the same Kla class. Okay, it's not going to change anything about the geometric behavior of those complex manifold of X. Okay? So in other words, the geometric behavior will be then uh, completely determined by this omega zero and also this first strand class. So once you know about the information, then uh, you know what will, you can actually at least predict on the topological level what kind of geometric behavior of the Kl Kl uh, of the Kl you will you have. Okay? And uh, so uh, one thing to illustrate this point is uh, there's a maximal existence time freedom by uh, Chao Juji and then eventually by Tian and Zhao Zhang. Okay? So first of all, um, the result says that the maximal existence time of the Kalevich for one, I mean, here's the, uh, the unnormalized version, um, the unnormalized Kalevich for dg dt equal to minus bg. It can be completely determined by the evolving Kähler class. So uh, it will stop exactly when the Kähler class uh, is no longer becomes positive. Okay, so positive class means that there's a one representation inside this cohomology class, so that that representation is positive. Uh, so this is what I mean by positive uh, a class here. Okay, um, so. This maximal extension time freedom implies many many things, okay? And also we can uh, use this to predict what happened when the Ritchieville encounters singularities, uh, or finite time singularity, infinite time singularities at the time capital T. So let me maybe illustrate this uh, uh, with a several uh, easy examples. Okay? So uh, keep in mind that uh, the result tells um, that Kähler Ritchieville will stop. Exactly when the initial uh, or well, exactly when the evolving Kähler class okay, is no longer positive. Okay? So uh, let's see what happens if uh, let's say C one is equal to zero. So that's so called the Calabria manifolds. Then uh, clearly the evolving Kähler class uh, is given by just a constant omega zero. Uh, so omega zero is a positive class. Okay, so therefore it. Uh, is always become positive, okay? Always positive, so therefore uh, we have long time existence. Uh, and then the metric uh, will converge to the Calabria metric smoothly. Um, this is the result by uh, Kwai Chow in 1985. So we can see kind of some prediction here because uh, you see that the class is being constant. Uh, so therefore, you don't expect uh, any volume collapsing, uh, and then by the behavior of the Ricci flow, it will tends to improving the regularity of the flow uh, as times uh, goes by. So it will naturally uh, converge to uh, the best, so called the best metric in the same Kähler class as the original one. Okay? So this result actually we prove the Calabi conjecture in the case of C one negative. Okay? which was originally proven by, by Yao before. Okay. And when the first trend class is negative, then we see um, the... Uh, and let's also assume, let's say, the uh, omega zero is equal to negative uh, of uh, C1, okay? So that is called a canonical cases, or can can canonical class case. Okay? Then uh, we can easily compute in this case. Then the omega t will becomes uh, uh, expand linearly, okay? starting from omega zero, and then will expand according to the rate of uh, omega zero. So if you assume 
you don't have negative one here, you replace it by negative any other negative numbers. Then we'll also expand, okay, but it's expanding in a different way. Then of course this is always positive uh, for any t, so therefore the capital T is also infinity according to uh, this maximal existence time frame. And so it will forever expand, okay, but you expect that if you try to divide this uh, metric by 1 over uh, 1 plus t, then uh, this metric here will have the fixed uh, Kähler class. And this will actually, uh, what Kwai Dong Chow proved in 1985, is that it will also converge smoothly to the unique uh, Kähler Einstein metric in the same class uh, as the omega zero. Um, so this give an alternative proof, a parabolic proof of Elban and Yao's result as well. Okay. Well, the behavior of uh, the case when first trend class is positive uh, is the most complicated okay, uh, among the three. Okay. Um, so there's uh, not really a complete understanding of what happened in this case, but I can showcase uh, some good results, okay? some easy results that I can talk about is uh, when the first trend class is positive and is equal to the initial class, okay? then the evolving killer class will be decaying or will be uh, shrinking in a linear rate. Okay? Uh, so it will have uh, become zero exactly when the t is equal to one, so therefore the maximal existence time is one. Okay? It will shrink, but you can expect that if you rescale, okay, by one over one minus t, then it will become a fixed scalar class. Okay? Uh, so uh, I have Proudman prove uh, that uh, after rescaling, okay, or, or before you rescaling, it will actually converge to a point. Okay? And after rescaling, um, there's some recent work by uh, Tan and Zhu and others okay, that shows uh, if uh, there exists a Kähler Einstein matrix already, you know already. Uh, there is a Kähler Einstein metric, or more generally, you know already that the x has a Kähler Ricci solo time. Then uh, the Kähler Ricci rule after you rescale, it will converge to that uh, Kähler Einstein metric or that uh, Kähler Ricci solo time. It's more like a uh, studying of uh, stability, okay? Because once you exist a Kähler Einstein metric or a Kähler Ricci uh, solo time, you can regard them as the fixed point of the flow, and then. What they show is uh, the Kelvin flow as a dynamical system. It will converge back to the fixed point, okay? uh, no matter how far you are going away from the fixed point. Okay? Um, so this is the result. You have a canonical case. So um, this canonical case address uh, what happened when C one the first trend class has a definite sign. Okay, so definite sign means, for example, negative means. Among all these uh, real one one form inside the, the C one, okay, uh, C one being negative means uh, it uh, has one uh, at least one uh, negative uh, real one one form okay, inside the C one. Okay. So you may ask, okay, what happened then if it's somewhere between C one being zero or C one being negative? Uh, so what you mean by somewhere between maybe? Uh, uh, you may say non-negative, but what it really means is uh, maybe you have some metric inside or some uh, represent, uh, representative inside the first trend class that is uh, non-positive definite, okay? So in a certain sense, okay? So this is what I mean by somewhere in between, okay? Uh, so let's see what will happen first of all uh, about a singular time, okay? Or about the existence time of the flow. So uh, somewhere in between is uh, if the C1 is not negative, okay, then because this is positive, so that would give you this is always positive. Okay? So one calorie here is uh, the anomalized Kähler Ricci flow uh, will have a long time solution. That is, if and only if the canonical bundle uh, is numerically effective, or in the short, we use the regular left. Okay? So this Kx. Being the miracle effective, uh, is in certain sense you may think of it that the negative of the first trend class, okay, is uh, non negative, okay. So, uh, this the first trend class of this uh, is 
the negative uh, c1 of x okay so therefore if this is non-negative then uh, with a minus sign it will become positive okay, okay so uh, so this really nice facts about uh, or a, ca a characterization of what happened when the Kelly visual when color long time solutions okay and then our goal is to try and study what happened in that case. Well, uh, there's a very, very long uh, conjecture concerning about uh, the left condition of the canonical bundle. Uh, so that is the abundance conjecture. Okay? So abundance conjecture actually predicts that the, uh, the left conditions okay, is equivalent to something called a semi-ample condition. Which is I'm going to uh, something I'm going to introduce uh, in the next slides. Okay. So uh, it's quite uh, it's not quite uh, difficult to show that uh, by the definition, kx being semi ample we implies this is left. Okay. But the other direction is still unknown. Okay. So this is called the abundance conjecture in algebraic geometry. And it's only known so far uh, in very low dimension. I think in low, low dimension, complex dimension, less than or equal to three. So let's see what uh, what I mean by semi ample. Okay. So uh, kx being semi ample. So what I mean uh, in algebraic language is that there exists a large integer. Uh, so that the sections here, okay, after you tens uh, take the tensor product of the kx for sufficiently large times. Uh, then it has uh, enough global sections for us to introduce a holomorphic maps into the projective space. So, um, what I mean by SM ample, first of all, is uh, there exists a certain integer k, so that, that gives you a holomorphic map. Okay? Uh, so, it's different from ample or very ample. Uh, for very ample, you will probably have to make sure the holomorphic map uh, f here is an, an, is an embedding. Okay? But now here we only require that to be holomorphic, well-defined holomorphic map into CPN. Okay, it may have uh, non-trivial uh, kernels. Okay, so it uh, or in in other words, it it uh, we allows F to have fibers, non-trivial fibers. Okay, with a whole fibers mapping into one point. Okay. Um. So the image of this uh, is uh, usually called a canonical model of X. Okay? And uh, in this talk, I'm going to denote it by omega. Okay? So omega is the image of the F. So um, more importantly, so uh, how is it uh, related to the study of the kelly vichy flow? Is it gives you a explicit form of the first chain class. Okay? So under this semi-ample uh, canonical blind bundle assumptions, um, the first term class can be shown to be equal to the negative of uh, uh, a certain k metric on the uh, canonical model. Okay. Uh, and this uh, dimension here is sometimes also called the Kodara dimension of x. Okay. Uh, so this um, semi ample conditions uh, give us a very explicit form or fairly explicit form of the first term class okay, for us to work with. So uh, let's see uh, what will be the picture uh, here, okay? Is that now um, you have a holomorphic map, F, from our manifold X down to a uh, complex, uh, maybe you may think that's a projective variety, um, sigma, okay? And the F here is uh, just holomorphic. It may have a non-trivial kernel. So what? It will happen, but the the singular point shouldn't take too much uh, space, okay? Because uh, by the Zach's theorems, the single values will form a set of measure zeros, okay? So uh, one thing you can imagine now with this semi-ample canonical bundles assumption, the picture will be like you have a uh, uh, sigma here, which is inside a CBN, uh, and then x. Is uh, some kind of vibration over uh, the sigma, okay? And then for each point, 
uh, the fiber may be singular, so the picture will be look like uh, there will be some regular fibers, okay, which are complex or manifold, uh, and also there may be some singular fibers. Okay. But those single fiber may not uh, be too much, okay, it will be having a, a set of measure zero and most. So uh, another thing I want to say is the first trend class conditions here, okay, is given by the pull back by the uh, by the map map, okay. So therefore, if you restrict on the fiber, okay, of a regular fiber, so let's say you have a regular fiber, uh, pi inverse of p, then this is going to be a uh, complex submanifold with it's a regular fiber where pi, uh, not pi, but, but f, I use f here, okay? So this fiber here will be a, com a, rec uh, will be a uh, complex of manifold, and then if you restrict it, uh, the first trend class on this uh, fiber, and then one interesting thing here is that it will be equal to the negative of f inverse, or f pullback, uh, and then restrict to this class, okay? And because along any tangent direction of these fibers, uh, they, uh, uh, f is going to be mapping to a constant, okay? So therefore, uh, if you have any tangent vectors, You put it into the push forward of uh, of half, okay? That is going to be zero, okay? So therefore, uh, the what I want to say here is then now restrict it, uh, restrict uh, you restrict the first train class, okay, of x onto each of the fiber, then it will become zeros. Or in other words, the fibers are Calabrian matrix. So this will be a structure of uh, of the Akina manifold uh, when the kx the same uh, the canonical Lie bundle. Is semi ample okay? Uh, I think in this talk it, it will be safe uh, for us to assume that this picture here is the definition of uh, kx being semi ample okay. If you you are not quite sure about what have what what's the meaning of all this algebraic language okay, you may take this picture as a definition. So once kx has a semi ample uh, condition, then it will in induce a vibration like this, uh, where you have a fibers which are given by uh, uh, which are Calabrian manifolds, and there are some very few, maybe none, okay? Uh, some single fibers that you have no control of the topology. Okay? So this is the rough picture of uh, the semi-ample case, okay? Uh, it's conjectured to be equivalent to saying that the kx is non-positive, non okay? Or uh, actually non-negative, okay? The left condition, okay? Uh, so just for uh, for your information, so left condition basically means if you integrate a kx, okay, or integrate a c1 of the kx along any curve, okay, this is going to be zero, okay, for any curve c, okay. Um, it's a integral condition, okay. So integral condition here, uh, how is it? Why is it equivalent to a more uh, refined condition about the structure of the, the vibration? Is it's, uh, it's quite hard to explain, so maybe uh, you want to uh, consult some uh, algebraic geometry experts, so why they think that they're equivalent to each other. Okay? But it's easy to see that the semi ample conditions will uh, imprice uh, the left condition, because uh, we have the C1 of this uh, to be given by a negative of uh, the pullback of the Kähler metric. Uh, so along the fiber direction is zero, but along the, the base direction is going to be positive. Okay? So this is uh, the picture. So from now on, I will call... Uh, so the picture here, okay? Let me copy and paste the picture to the next slide. So for any p uh, on the base manifold, uh, we'll call xp to be a fiber based on p. Okay? And if uh, p is a regular value of f, okay, then we call it a regular fiber. Uh, and 
according to our discussion before, uh, is going to be a Calabi R manifold. Uh, or otherwise, uh, P will be called a single value and then we call it a single fiber. Okay? So I should also remark that the, the sigma itself it may be also single as well. Okay, So um, in that case, we also count P as a singular or X sub P to be a singular fiber as well. Okay? So uh, let's come back to the discussion about the Keller Vichy flow. Okay? So under the Keller Vichy flow, uh, so let's say sometimes uh, we will subtract an extra omega here uh, to make the volume being constant. So I will come back to that uh, pretty soon. Okay. Um, so let me denote S to be a set of singular values. Okay. Singular values that include, first of all, F uh, have a singular value at that point, and also the uh, uh, the points where the where the uh, sigma becomes singular. Okay. Um, so if the Kodama dimension is zero is zero, okay, that means the dimension of the sigma is just zero. So that means the sigma is just a point. Uh, then you have only one singular, uh, one regular fiber. So there's only one uh, Calabial fiber. So in certain sense, it's itself a Calabial manifold. So that we uh, we already have a result by quantum Childs uh, that shows it converged to a Vichy Vat metric. Uh, and if the Kodawa dimension is n, uh, and also uh, you have no singularity, okay? so this is another extreme okay? that the basically we have no fibers, and the sigma has no singularities. Okay? Then this case uh, is equivalent equivalent to say the kx is ample or uh, the c one is negative. Okay? Uh, so you already studied by Chow in 1985 before, and then it shows. That after you rescale, okay, it will converge uh, to a negative K Einstein metric. So we rescale in a way by subtracting an extra omega here to make sure the volumes do not blow up. Okay, it binds the volume along the flow. Okay. Um, well, if you have some singularities, okay, but still the dimension of the Kodawa dimension, that means the, the sigma here is equal to the dimension of X. Uh, is so called a left case but not big. Uh, so it's so called the left and back case, but not ample case. Uh, then there's a result by Chuji, Ten, and Zhao Zhang that shows uh, it will converge. Uh, the long lines which differ will converge um, to a positive, some some kind of positive current okay, that represents a negative of the C one, okay. and also away from those uh, singular points. Okay. Uh, the convergence is actually smooth as well. So these are the case when the Kodawa dimension is either zero or n in a uh, the two extreme cases of the Kodawa dimensions. Okay, so n is the dimension of x. Okay, uh, so either if it's zero or n, then it comes down to the Calabria case or an ample or left case. Um, so one thing that makes uh, this case. Uh, Easy to handle is uh, the left and back conditions actually implies uh, the kx is semi ample. So, therefore, uh, uh, everything just comes down to the picture that we have before. Okay? Um, what we are interested in is uh, the intermediate case. Okay? And there's a lot of uh, uh, research undergoing uh, right now uh, over the past. Uh, over the past maybe 15 or 20 years or so. Uh, so in this case, first of all, um, we have a non-trivial fibers and also non-trivial base. Okay? Base is the sigma and then fiber is also uh, is also non-trivial. Okay? Non-trivial means it's not just a point. Okay? So it was first uh, studied by Song and Tan, who proved uh, there's a convergence in the sense of current um, to a certain positive uh, or actually, what means non-negative current, okay, uh, away from S, okay? and also uh, away from S, which is the singular set, okay, the uh, the limit of uh, the metric, okay, the weak limit of the metric, uh, which is given by this, okay, will also satisfy a some some kind of like a, a an Einstein equation, okay, but it's not really Einstein equation, okay. Is an Einstein equation uh, adding an extra term called the Weyl-Peterson term, 
And this wild Peterson term is reflecting how much uh, the complex structure of uh, the fiber changes uh, when you varies uh, along the, the base manifold and then you look at how the complex structure of the fiber ch changes. Uh, then this term is actually reflecting uh, how much it changes. Okay? So if there's no change in the complex structure, so meaning that all the fibers are biholomorphic to each other, then this wild Peterson term is actually zero. And then you really get an Einstein metric. Well, uh, in their work, um, they actually conjecture that the convergence can actually be improved, first of all, to a global gromov hausdorff topology on X. Okay? And uh, more importantly, they conjecture that uh, the convergence is actually smooth away from single fibers. So uh, both conjecture here are not yet completely solved, but there's a lot of progress going on. Okay? So uh, let me first report about the progress okay, of this conjecture. So um, in the case when x uh, is a product, a direct product. So here what I mean here is uh, the topo uh, from the topology of x is a product. Okay? It's a product of an elliptic uh, manifold. So that means uh, an E that, that has a uh, flat matrix. And also uh, a Complicated manifold with negative first strand class. Okay. So what I mean here is uh, topological topological speaking, you have X being a product, but you do not start from a uh, product metric. Okay, because if you start from a product metric, then the result is trivial. Okay. Because uh, once you start with uh, product metrics, okay, then along the K Lovichi flow will preserve uh, it will preserve the, the product structure of the metric. So basically, it will come down to individual independent flows on E and also uh, on the omega or uh, on the sigma. So there's nothing interesting to the study in the product, in a metric product case. Okay. Uh, so in this case, uh, Matthew Gill proved that uh, no matter what metric you start with, okay, what I mean, just topologically, X is a product, but not the, the metric being product, okay. Uh, then uh, he proved that the convergence is really smooth. Okay, so we're applying the song and Tan conjecture uh, in this special broad case. And uh, when X is uh, fibered by uh, complex toroid, so what I mean here is uh, the fibers they are Calabria manifold, and then one special or one uh, uh, a popular or uh, Anyway, so one important kind of uh, Calabria manifold are uh, complex toroid. Okay? So in case when X is fibered by complex toroids, and then here we allow the complex structure to change. Okay? Uh, so it's basically, be, you, you may think of it as uh, uh, a lot of donuts. Okay? Uh, parameterized by the, by the base. Okay? And then the donuts, okay, uh, it may have different complex structures. Okay? So if you think of it as a lattice, the lattice structure can change uh, when you move along the base. Okay? Um, and also assume there's a rational assumption of the of the uh, initial Kähler metric. Okay? Then myself and Zhao Jiang prove uh, that the convergence is actually also smooth. Okay? And this use uh, uh, Gross, Tosati, and Zhang's uh, results, okay, uh, and and their works is on the elliptic problems about collapsing of uh, rigid flat metrics, and then we apply it uh, in a parabolic setup, okay. Uh, we have one extra assumption here, but it's later removed uh, by Han and Tosati, okay. Uh, so now the theorem is now that uh, whenever you have a uh, the x being uh, in the same minimal case. If it's fiber by complex tori, uh, then we actually will have uh, smooth convergence away from single fibers. So therefore, this case, uh, this will uh, uh, address the Song and Tan conjecture, this part of the Song and Tan conjecture uh, in the torus fiber case. Well, uh, generally, if uh, you don't have any topological assumptions on the fiber, uh, there's a work by Tosati, Weinkoff, and Yang okay, prove that in general, um, the convergence can be uh, uh, is in C0 sense with respect to the metric okay, away from the singular fibers as well. Okay. Um, 
but generally speaking, uh, whether uh, you always have smooth convergence is uh, still unknown. Okay, but we have some progress. I will. I'm going to talk about it uh, pretty soon. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the summary of my the result that I dis just described. Okay, uh, the result by myself and Chao Zhang. Okay, so. Uh, Along a normalized scalar vegetable on X, okay, with semi ample KX, okay, and if uh, we assume that the regular uh, fibers are complex sori, okay, then we actually have smooth convergence okay, down to the canonical matrix on the canonical uh, base, okay, uh, uh, sigma, okay, and convergence is in C infinity sense locally, okay. and another thing that is. Uh, also, a uh, consequence of these results is that the Riemann curvature will be bounded okay, along the, the flow. Okay? So if you fix a compact set on the regular part of the manifold, uh, that means away from single fibers, okay, then the Riemann curvature will be uniformly bounded along the whole flow. Um, so uh, when S is uh, empty, so that means there's no singular fibers. So this result, uh, number one here, actually uh, show that uh, the song and tan conjecture is actually true. Okay, we actually have Gromov Hausdorff convergence. Okay, when you have no singular fibers. Okay, and uh, one thing about uh, point two here is that there's another lamp for uh, for Riemann being bounded. Okay. That is, uh, if the Riemann curvature is uniformly bounded on the whole manifold along the flow, um, then the Vichyfo is uh, solution is called a type three solution. Okay? So, uh, if you don't have any single fiber, then this result here is actually on the whole manifold. So, therefore, you have a type three solution. Okay? Well, um, I think it's still open. One of one is still true. Okay, if uh, the fibers are not complex toroids or they're finite quotients. Okay. So uh, we have some recent results, okay, uh, with our collaborators, okay, but um, the full uh, generality uh, is about uh, what one still holds if the fibers are not complex toroids, uh, is still open as of today, okay. Okay, so let me briefly describe uh, what's the idea of the proof uh, in the in the works uh, with Zhao Zhang. Well, the key idea is to uh, use a parabolic analog of gross totality and Yu Guang Zhang uh, works about collapsing of each effect matrix. Okay? Uh, so let me maybe outline the point why the torus uh, condition is important here. Okay? Uh, so basically, uh, if uh, you have a torus vibration, so a torus it can be parameterized. By C, okay, so it has a universal cover by by C n, okay? so that makes our analysis much easier. You, you, we can rescale the torus fiber by uh, any factor, maybe time independent, uh, time dependent factor in front, okay? and after rescaling, it's still a torus. Okay? So if you work with uh, other manifolds, uh, you have to cover it by many many different tracks. Okay? Um, so if you do do rescaling, um, then uh, the co coordinate system will will have some problem with. So so if you you try to enlarge the the chunks, uh, it may not uh, give you the right. Uh, so it will have some problem with uh, the overlap of the chunks. Okay, but for torus you don't have a problem because you just pass it uh, to the universal cover C C N, okay? and then you can do the rescaling. Okay? And uh, in the Gross, Dosati, and Zhang's paper, okay, uh, they construct some really special reference metric that has a very good scaling properties. So why scaling property is important here? Because uh, the picture of the Kelovich flow is that uh, the fibers are going to collapse. So if the fiber collapse, you can imagine the GIJ terms of the Laplacian, for example. Okay? It will not be staying to be uniformly elliptic because the G upper IJ term 
if some direction of the lower IJ collapses, then the G upper IJ term will be un become unbounded. So if it become unbounded, then it's quite hard for us to apply the shelter's estimates or bootstrapping uh, techniques to show you have a you have a uh, high order estimates. We need to use shelter estimates, okay? And therefore, we have to make sure the uh, the Laplacian, for example, the Laplacian operator uh, is uniformly elliptic uh, along the flow. But with this special metric, reference metric, okay, we are able to rescale the flow. Uh, so that uh, the leading order term, I mean the term, uh, the reference term before the leading bar, uh, it becomes an elliptic term. Okay, so if you consider the Laplacian operator with respect to this metric, this rescaled metric, then uh, it will be, it will be truly uniform elliptic. So that allows us to use a shelter estimate. So uh, this is a basic outline. So it, it, it comes down to uh, a local Montgomery pair equations. That is a uniform elliptic. Okay, so this is semi-flat matrix. So along the uh, fibers is positive. Okay, and then this metric here is along the basis positive. Okay, along the other direction it will be zero. So along the base direction this may be zero as well. Okay, but if you if you add them together, okay, that will become a positive metric, okay? a fixed positive metric. So that allows us to use, uh, for example, even Krilov theory for the C two alpha estimates and also uh, for high order bootstrapping. Uh, we can pass it uh, to the Laplacian operator. Uh, then this is still an elliptic operator. Okay? Uh, if you rescale it in this way, so that it becomes uh, so basically a symbol of uh, the uh, Laplacian here is basically uh, given by by this term here. Okay. So uh, we do bootstrapping, but a parabolic bootstrapping to show we have uh, indeed a uh, smooth convergence. Okay. So this is some standard uh, bootstrapping techniques, okay? Um, and why we need to, that to be a torus? Because uh, we have to make use of the metric, uh, reference metric constructed in, in this paper to allow us to pass the Kelvin flow equations into another form that is uh, locally, at least uh, 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 locally uh, uniform elliptic. So uh, as I mentioned before, we not only prove we have a smooth convergence, okay, so this lies here, we also prove another thing about the V-bound curvature. So we show along, uh, uh, away from the single fiber, actually the V-bound curvature is uh, bounded along the floor. Okay? So let's uh, further elaborate on this point here. Okay? So what's so special about uh, the curvature bound? Um, so for Riemann curvature, uh, if the fibers are complex toroids, uh, then uh, the Riemann curvature is uniform bounded, okay, away from single fibers. But there's another interesting result, okay, that's by Tosati and Yuguan Zhang, okay, who show that if the fibers are the the other cases, they are if they are not complex toroids. So for this, I uh, uh, I means complex toroids also including its finite quotient. So if uh, the fibers are not complex toroids or is uh, is uh, finite quotient, okay, then uh, they show that the Riemann curvature will always blows up. Well, the key idea is uh, using some blow up argument. You sh you show after we scale the flow, it will converge to a rich effect metric cross the Euclidean space. So it converges to a rich effect metric, but if your uh, fibers they are not uh, they are not uh, complex torus. Then it will have a zero which curvature, but non-trivial Riemann curvature. So if after rescaling you have a non-trivial, non-zero Riemann curvature, then that would means before you rescale, uh, the Riemann curvature must blow up. Okay, because the rescaling will tends to decrease the curvature. So, uh, so one may wonder. So there's a strong connection. Of uh, one of Riemann curvature is banded with the topology of the fibers, uh, so you may uh, predict that uh, whether the boundedness of the Riemann curvature conditions uh, is actually uh, topological. That means independent of the choice of the initial metric. 
Well, uh, this is uh, uh, we'll come back to that later, and this is a very good uh, question to to ask. Because, uh, there's a, a some ongoing uh, research research work that suggests that there's a close connection between uh, the curvature bank or along the Kelly Ricci flow and the and the type of uh, the topological type of the manifold. Okay. Well, uh, the so far not much is known when um, you have a, a regular fiber being a toroid, but you also have uh, singular fibers. Then whether the Riemann curvature is banded or not, okay, uh, this is still unknown. Um, but let's change the gear a little bit uh, and then uh, say something about the other curvature, scalar curvature and Ricci curvature. So scalar feature, interestingly, uh, there's a very general result okay, that uh, by, is by Song and Tan. Uh, they show that uh, the scalar curvature must be uniformly bounded along the normalized scalar energy flow. So again, all these are in the case of semi-ample uh, canonical light bundle. Okay? And that is regardless of uh, the type of the topology of the fibers, regardless of whether you have singular fibers. So no matter what kind of fibers you have, uh, no matter whether you have singular fibers, the scalar curvature is always uniformly bounded. Okay. This is really interesting result. Okay, uh, and uh, one thing is the Riemann curvature. Okay, is may blow up. Okay, if your fibers a lot, uh, uh, if your fibers a lot. Uh, complex torus, okay? but the scalar curvature will be still bounded. So uh, this is amazing, okay. Uh, and also there's a uh, another work, recent work by Jen, uh, who show that uh, actually the scalar curvature will converge to a certain negative topological constant away from single fiber as well. Uh, so in particular, I mean it's bounded away from single fibers, but also uh, it will converge to a constant, okay, uh, away from singular fibers. Okay. Let me also say something about the Ricci curvature. Okay, so uh, the Ricci curvature uh, turns out okay is somewhere in between Riemann curvature and scalar curvature. Okay, but what's so interesting uh, about the Ricci curvature is uh, the uniform bound of the Ricci curvature is actually a very important hypothesis. Especially about the gromov hausdorff convergence of the Kelly-Ricci flow. So Song and Han uh, propose or conjecture that uh, we have gromov hausdorff convergence. It's kind of metric space convergence. Uh, when you have a semi-ample uh, kx, uh, this conjecture is still uh, open. Okay, but what uh, Song, Tian, and Chen Lei Zhang show that uh, once you have a uniform Ricci bank on a certain label of a, of a regular fiber, okay, so you have a regular fiber and then you have a label containing it. Okay. Uh, and then if we know that the Ricci curvature along the Kähler Ricci flow uh, is banded on that label, then it will imply the Gromov out of convergence. So it uh, proposed that the uniform bank of the Ricci curvature is really an important condition that we have to probably uh, have to look at it further. Okay. But uh, so uh, of course, we bank bank that we implies uh, the Ricci is banded. Okay, so uh, according to our observations, uh, uh, that about the various convergence results and also uh, the the boundedness of the Riemann curvature, it suggests that the uniform bound property of the Riemann curvature should only depend on the topology of the manifold, but not uh, on the initial kilometric. So it was conjectured to be so even in the left case uh, by Tosadi and Yu Wang Chang. Okay? Uh, and then in the semi ample case, uh, I think uh, uh, there's a recent work about it. Okay, uh, but let me. Say something about uh, um, 
so what is the progress so far? So uh, for this conjecture, so I think the most difficult difficult case, as I said before, okay, is when the complex torus are I mean the regular fibers are complex torus, but we don't have uh, we we have singular fibers. Uh, then it's quite hard for us to determine uh, a precise topological conditions on the singular fibers, so under which the Riemann curvature is uh, uniform bounded. But there are some partial results, uh, first given by, for example, Tosade and Yu Guang Zhang. Okay? Uh, and they show that when the dimension is 2 and also the Kodawa dimension is 1, okay? then the G flow will have uh, bounded Riemann curvature if and only if all the singular fibers is of a certain algebraic type. Okay? Uh, and in high dimensions, so there's also some. Uh, Necessary conditions introduced by uh, Ya Zhang Zhang okay? uh, concerning about also the algebraic uh, type of the singular fibers as well. So, um, so one may ask, okay? uh, you see, all this results suggest that uh, while the Riemann curvature is bounded a lot, okay, has nothing to do with the initial metric, but it has something to do with the topology of the fibers. So generally, uh, uh, it was proven to be true that uh, this uh, result by uh, Ya Zhang Zhang, okay, uh, that shows if one metric along the kähler vichy row has a bounded Riemann curvature, again, I assume the kx is semi-ample, uh, then uh, it would be also true for any other metric starting on the same kähler manifold. So, uh, so combining with my previous work by uh, with uh, with uh, Zhao Zhang, so if uh, you have complex torus as the regular fibers, uh, so then if you know about the boundless of the Riemann curvature, uh, away from the let's see, okay, combining results, if the fibers are complex torus. Then the Riemann curvature is oh okay okay so I, I I see okay so let me draw pictures so if you have a sigma here and then you have a singular fiber okay. so yes we know that away from singular fibers okay uh, by by previous uh, works uh, with Zhao Zhang okay we already know about the uh, the uh, uh, curve, uh, the Riemann curvature is also always uniform bounded away from the single fibers. Okay, so now if you have a open set containing one singular fibers, okay. So if you have open set containing one singular fibers, okay, or containing all of the singular fibers, let me let me say containing all of the singular fibers, then uh. Combining these two results, we know that if you have a neighborhood containing all the singular fibers, if on one metric, starting from one metric, the Riemann curvature is uh, bounded, then it will be also to be true starting from any other Kähler metric. Okay? So this is the case when you have a one single neighborhood containing all singular fibers. But you may ask, how about if you have only a label containing one singular fiber, then uh, but uh, you can say that the uniform bounded property of the Riemann will be also independent of the initial Kähler matrix because this is a an other interesting question to ask, uh, and then we prove that it's actually true. Okay. So uh, here's the result. Okay. Uh, so suppose x is a compact Kähler manifold again with uh, the semi ample kx, uh, and then you have a vibration map uh, denoted by the f. Um, so the result says the following. So if you have a whole, any open set containing one whole fibers, and this whole fiber can be regular, can be singular, uh, so that you have a uh, curvature blow up rates uh, uh, when you restrict on this uh, open set U. Okay? So this tau t here is just any increasing function of t. Okay? Uh, so the conclusion is the following. So there will exist a smaller label around this uh, uh, 
around this uh, well inside this uh, this uh, original label view again containing the whole fibers that we are talking about then assign with another matrix then we are able to conclude that the the bound of the Riemann curvature would be related to original uh, or to, uh, related to the uh, the bound of another metric in the following way okay so if you you have as x being a regular fiber then uh, they will blow up the curvature will blow up a similar rate okay uh, one is uh, tau t and then the other one is just some constant times tau t so if the fiber is singular uh, we have a recurrent result okay? that says that the if you replace another matrix then that metric will also blow up in this uh, exponential weight okay? and most in this exponential weight okay? but nonetheless okay, if you assume that this is a constant okay, taking, the, taking that to be a C then both will be a constant okay? so therefore uh, it's a calorie okay? so if uh, uh, you have one fiber uh, that, and then you also have an open set around it okay? so that uh, starting from one matrix the Riemann curvature of this label okay, uh, is uh, uniformly bounded along the flow then it will also true start with any other kind of metric okay. so that gives a local version of Yasan Zhang's result that was previously appeared okay. uh, so he assumed the Riemann curvature is bounded on the whole manifold then starting from any other kind of metric will be also bounded okay. and then our improvement here shows that uh, we can actually localize this result okay, by taking a uh, assuming uniform bound on the Riemann curvature on just an open neighborhood around one fiber okay? and then it will also show the sign with any other metrics it will also have a uniform Riemann curvature bound well the idea is uh, using some maximum principles okay? but uh, this a technical uh, in uh, issues here, okay. There's uh, to prove all these Riemann curvature bands and all this, okay. One natural way is to use the maximum principle, of course. But you use maximum principle, probably maximum principle. Um, you will have uh, to consider the Laplacian, for example. So, uh, what typical way of localizing a certain estimate uh, is to multiply by some kind of functions but uh, for a static problem so if you only have a fixed metric okay, to play around with okay, uh, that means the metric is not evolving okay. then constructing the uh, kind of functions uh, is quite standard okay. I mean for at least for geometric analysis it's quite standard for us to construct the color functions but now uh, you have an evolving metric okay? and when you construct color function you want to have some bound for the uh, for the Laplacian operator and also for the for the gradient operator but now the metric is evolving and also uh, let's say the uh, fiber direction is decaying so therefore uh, you turn it to g upper ij for the Laplacian uh, the Laplacian here is no longer a bounded thing okay? it's uh, the g up i j is blowing up okay so therefore when you construct color functions somehow you want to localize a certain estimates then you want these terms to be bounded as well uh, so that is the difficulty okay how do you try to localize a certain estimate but at the same time keeping also using these color functions so that along the the evolving color ratio flow is still keeping all these gradient term and also the Laplacian term to be bounded okay that is uh, the hard part of uh, localizing the estimates. So uh, we overcome this difficulty by looking at the semi ample condition. With semi ample conditions, okay, you can actually use uh, the embedding map okay, or the holomorphic map into CPN. So one thing we can do is how about we construct a bump function inside the CPN first, and then we pull it back by this map. Okay? And one good thing about this is that uh, uh, this map here will have uh, constant will be constant along the fibers so when you take the uh, 
Laplacian gradient. Okay, so basically you can ignore the const uh, the the constant direction, so lambda, the fibrous directions. Uh, so there's a well long Schwarz type estimate that shows uh, the omega t is actually uniform bounded along the base directions. So base direction is always fine, so it's always uniformly bounded. Okay, but it will blow up or shrink to zero along the uh, fiber directions. Okay. But if uh, the gradient term and also uh, the Laplace term has nothing to do with the fiber directions, then we will expect to have a band for both uh, the Laplace and the gradient as well, along the K-Mamichi curve. So that allows us to localize uh, all these estimates. Okay, so a prime first localize the sheath estimates. Okay, uh, by considering this uh, ex extra uh, uh, color function terms. Okay? Proving the gradient estimate, okay. I think it it can go up the, to a higher degree as well, okay. But I, this is all I needed here, okay. Uh, and also uh, using localized estimates, okay, uh, we're able to to do uh, some localized estimation of, uh, for example, Riemann curvature. Uh, what was kind of complicated, so I'm I'm kind of skipping the detail here, okay. Uh, and also the difference between the Christopher symbols of two metrics, okay. Uh, and using all this, uh, we are able to get a band, okay, because the Laplacian term of this and also gradient terms of this, uh, we can bank it uniformly. Okay? So that allows us to do um, most of the analysis here smoothly, uh, without worrying about uh, how much it blows up along the flow. So uh, another thing is uh, why we have a better result when you have a regular fibers. It actually comes down to the result that I proved with uh, Zhao Zhang before. Okay? Uh, that on the regular fibers, we actually have uh, any kind of metrics. Uh, any two metrics will be uniformly equivalent to each other. If you have a regular fiber, you have a label containing this regular fibers. Uh, so that's why it's it's somehow better, but if you have a singular fiber, um, then you have to just to try to do something more. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the best we can get by comparing two metrics. Uh, is that we can the best we can show is that assuming uh, the Riemann of one of them is bounded by tau, then uh, when comparing the eigenvalues of two metrics, okay, they will be related to each other with an exponential way. So therefore, we have exponential term. When we estimate the Riemann curvature of any of uh, the two metrics, okay. so let me not talk too much about this because it's uh, uh, kind of uh, applying a maximum principle. But the outline here, the upshot here is we have a good color kind of functions that allows us to do uh, the localization uh, when we apply the maximum principles. So as as I uh, as I mentioned before, well, uh, the conjecture by Song and Tan uh, it has uh, two parts. So one part is about uh, the gromov hausdorff convergence, okay? and it it has something to do with. Uh, let me go back here. Okay? It has something to do with the Ricci curvature. Um, so uh, one nice thing try to. Uh, maybe good to think about is what the result uh, of uh, of my and uh, Yasan Zhang can be improved by assuming just uniform band of the Vichy curvature. Okay? So that I think uh, is a good problem to think about because of the the results on the uh, Vichy curvature by Song Tian and uh, and Chen Lei Zhang. Okay? Uh, another conjecture about uh, this uh, same bow case is uh, the conjecture that the, away from singular fibers, we actually have smooth convergence. Okay? Well, this is still uh, open okay, in full generality. Okay? Uh, but recently, we have some results uh, in a special case when the fibers are biomorphic to each other. So let me uh, describe the the result here. Uh, so we prove a higher order regularity result, okay, uh, with uh, mentioned Lee uh, early this year. 
So again, in the semi ample case, uh, again, uh, also the Godawa dimension is not the extreme cases. Okay? But we are further assume the regular fibers are biomorphic to each other. Okay? Then we actually prove the normalized killer vegetable will converge smoothly away from single fiber as well. And more importantly, uh, we, we can actually say something about a bitchy curvature. Okay? So in this case, in the same assumptions, under the same assumptions, then we can actually show the bitchy curvature of uh, any label containing uh, any regular fibers is uniformly packed along the floor. So that verify the additional hypothesis of many works that appear before, uh, including the Gromov house stuff convergence result by Song Tian and Chen Yang. Uh, they assume that uh, the visual curvature is bounded. Okay. Uh, so here we supply the proof that the visual curvature under this case, uh, when the fibers are biomorphic to, to each other, okay, the visual curvature is really bounded. Okay. So the idea is uh, basically use uh, uh, Han and Tosadi's works about collapsing of visual effect metric. This is an elliptic uh, problem. Uh, it's uh, proved by very delicated uh, blob analysis. So, uh, which I'm, uh, I plan not to talk too much about the detail, but the key ingredient here is we have to apply, uh, in order to extend the elliptic works okay, to the killer which flow setup, which is a proper uh, problem, okay? uh, we have to establish a proper version of the so called cylindrical shell estimate. So, why cylindrical comes, comes in is uh, if you want to prove something about uh, the higher order regularity, uh, when you restrict on a uh, regular fiber, okay? so let's say you have a label here containing a regular fiber, then it's uh, basically in the shape of uh, a ball crossed with uh, uh, certain open Z, okay? or a ball crossed with uh, with a fiber, okay. So let's say the topology of the fiber is uh, given by. Let me think of a symbol. So so let me just f, okay. So f is denoting the topological type of the fiber, okay. Uh, so we are basically applying the uh, analyzing the curvature, or uh, analyzing the regularity of the metric, on this uh, set where where b is the base. Uh, B is the uh, open set of the base and then cross with a certain fiber. So you have a cylindrical thing. Uh, so vertical is F and then horizontal is B. Okay? So we need to uh, use a certain special type of uh, shelter estimates. Cylindrical type of this is a cylindrical shape. Okay? Uh, and the metric, remember, is collapsing. So therefore, uh, the standard uh, parabolic shell estimate may not working very well. Okay, so we need to have a, a cylindrical type of uh, uh, shell estimate in order to carry out all this this analysis. And let's also say something about why we have such <coughs> sorry uh, such a calorie. Okay, that means uh, the rich curvature is uniformly banded along the flow, and then this is because uh, the metric. Or the topology of the regular fibers is uh, actually a Calabria metric. So on a Calabria metric, uh, we have a Vichy flat metric representations on it. This is by, by result of Yao. And so locally, we can actually compare the metric with a product metric like this. Okay? And so the way of uh, deriving a higher order regularity uh, is uh, basically with respect to this evolving product metric. Okay? Uh, and then basically we prove the metric with respect to this evolving metrics uh, it has a high order bound okay uh, so one nice thing about this is then uh, this this metric is rich flat okay this rich metric is rich flat uh, and then you have uh, uh, higher order in particular second order band of the GT which is the Kähler rich flow solutions with respect to this rich flat metric okay? Uh, so that will shows we have a uniform 
uh, which you can visit by X, okay? But just try go inequalities. So um, it follows we have uniform uh, which you can visit by uh, because that you know, you have a zero which you can visit for this matrix, okay? Uh, so just by some triangle inequality argument, we are able to show the GT will actually have a uniform curvature band. Okay, so uh, so that's why we have a uh, this result. But let me by uh, in the last slides, uh, let me just summarize uh, what is still unknown uh, about the Kenovich field in the case of semi-ample KX. Okay? So how about uh, the high order regularity of the flow when the fibers, the regular fibers are not homomorphic to each other. Okay. Uh, I think it's going to be a very hard question, first of all, okay. But uh, it's unknown so far, okay. Uh, well, the Ritchie curvature bank is, now we see is an interesting question because assuming Ritchie curvature bank uh, around a regular fibers, okay, that's on 10 and 10 and prove that we have Gromoff house stuff convergence, okay. So how about uh, the question, how about the rigid curvature bands when the regular fibers are log by homomorphic? So high order regularity, I think, is very hard to get. Okay? But the more, uh, how is it, realistic question is how about the rigid curvature band? Okay? That may be more ta uh, tractable than the, the first question, I believe. Or one may ask a similar question as in my work with uh, Yasan Zhan. So if the rich curvature band is uniformly banded along the flow okay, on a certain uh, label around a regular fiber, okay, so let's say starting with one metric you have this, okay, then is this still true if we flow along uh, from any other initial, initial metric on the same killer manifold? Okay? And this, uh, to my best knowledge, is still unknown. Okay? But it would be a very interesting question to ask. Okay? It's maybe easier than the previous two, uh, but it has some significance okay? because the rich curvature band will, uh, it appears to be a, a common hypothesis in many other works, okay? especially those con uh, concerning about uh, the uh, the Gromov house of convergence. Okay, okay so uh, this uh, is the end of my talk. Okay? Thank you for your attention.